Well, it's been 30 years since the AI lab started. Uh, in the mid-1980s, uh, Ramesh Jain, Terry Weymouth, and Brian Schunk started the Computer Vision Research Lab here at Michigan. Uh, that was in the EECS building. Um, around that time, a few other, other of us, Steve Litton and me, joined Michigan as faculty, and we together then formed the AI lab starting in 1988, 86, let's see, 88, and with a lot of other faculty from around the university. And at that time, we then moved to the Advanced Technology Laboratories Building, ATL. And although the AI lab was housed within computer science and engineering sort of programmatically, it really drew from across the university. We had a lot of faculty from CSE, but we also had faculty from psychology, such as Steve Kaplan, John Holland, and Bob Lindsay. Um, within CSE, Ed Durfee joined us, Lynn Conway, Steve Littinen, Elliot Soloway, and Dave Kiris. And that was sort of the thing about the AI lab in the beginning, and I think it's been uh, throughout its history, is that we really try to cover lots of different aspects of AI, from its core originally in computer vision and doing work in natural language, cognitive architecture, multi-agent systems, genetic algorithms, and then always a big theme of robotics. And I'll claim it within us right here. The reason we've got the robotics building there is because of all the great robotics work that's been done in the AI lab over the years, along with a lot of other robotics work throughout the university. But I think we played a key role. So, oh, um, that was a special time um, of being in ATL. Uh, I think a lot of our former students and faculty, uh, we were a group among ourselves, but then, the opportunity came to move with the rest of computer science and engineering, and we moved to the Beister building where we have now been for the last 12 or 13 years. And that's gone very well, and so that we've been integrated more into the overall computer science and engineering. One of the things that a lab like that does is try to think about what, I try to think about is what kind of impact we have. And we've written lots of papers throughout the years and done lots of research, gotten a lot of research money. But I think the real contribution we've made is in the students that have been um, educated and the hundreds, literally hundreds of PhD students that have graduated from the University of Michigan in artificial intelligence. And if you look in the different areas and the way they've had impact, a lot of that has been gone on to other places where they have taught students about artificial intelligence who then have their own impact. We've also had a lot of impact just on the research and on people going into commercial sector. So for example, uh, if you ask, who is the, the CTO of Waymo? That is a former University of Michigan PhD. And we can list lots of people like that that are throughout the industry that came from the University of Michigan. The other thing is we ha also have impact uh, in, in the global discourse about AI. What happened last week? Well, let's not go in the political side of what happened last week. But there was an article in the New York Times by Melanie Mitchell, who was a graduate of the AI lab at the University of Michigan. So we have people going out there and making all sorts of uh, different impacts. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna transition to some, one specific student who had impact um, throughout your lives as well. So Scott Huffman is our invited speaker. Scott was a student who started here at the same time that the AI lab started in 19, um, 88. He graduated in 1993. He then went on to work at Price Waterhouse from 1994 to uh, 1998. At the end of that, he was Director of Global Research and Development. Now that might sound that he had about 2,000 people working for him, but I believe Global Research and Development meant a small group that was doing AI research and development. Uh, from there, um, he went and worked at, oh, and I don't have it written down the name of the company, Canova, Canova, uh, where he was VP of engineering. And then in 2005, he went to work at Google. Now, talk about impact. Uh, the story uh, that uh, Scott tells is how one day he was walking down the, the hallway and the previous day he'd said, you know, maybe we should spend a little bit more effort on how we do uh, search on these new things called iPhones. And the next day somebody came up to him and said, Scott, how about you take over mobile search? And so every time you use your iPhone, your uh, Pixel or whatever, 
thank Scott for the kind of interface and services it provides because that went in a different direction than what was going on in the desktop because they took seriously the form factor and what kind of questions people asking it. He then worked on the voice interface for uh, Google Search and then for the last couple of years he's been head of Google Assistant. So here is someone who is having an effect on you and all your lives. Now as a graduate student Scott was a great graduate student, but you never know how a graduate student's gonna transition into the real world. And so I happened to go on to the web and find out that he transitioned very well, and I think he is a great example of what we wanna produce in terms of our students that go out there and become leaders. So this is a, um, an unattributed quote I will read. Scott is the best manager I've ever had. His clarity of vision, his integrity, and his precision of execution are legendary. I have seen him turn an ossified and despair, despairing engineering department around to create a humming and consistently producing innovation machine in a matter of weeks. He did this by hiring the right people and treating them right. He can cut through corporate fog, fog and entrenched politics to get to the core of any issue. At any meeting, trust him to ask the key questions that nobody else dares to ask or that everyone else has overlooked. So I'm really pleased to invite Scott to come up and give our uh, invited speech for today. I think you'll learn a lot from what he has to tell us. Thank you very much, Scott. Oh, thanks, John. All right, now I feel like the expectations are high. working. Fabulous. Hi, everyone. I'm Scott. For those who haven't met me, and let me just say uh, thank you for having me. It's a huge honor for me to be here uh, and to speak at the 30th anniversary of the AI Lab. Uh, and uh, I thought what it might be interesting for folks is to hear a little bit about, uh, I guess I'll say what I've been doing since I left here at Michigan, which is building real-world AI products. Uh, now, as John said, I arrived here in 1988, uh, at the beginning of the AI Lab. You can, you can tell that's me, because obviously I look exactly the same. <laughs> uh, drove up and, and arrived on campus, uh, and of course, right away, I realized that it was gonna take dedication and prioritization uh, to succeed at what every new Michigan student needs to do first, which is obtaining my season tickets. So I obtained my season tickets, and that year, uh, Bo Schembechler's Michigan Wolverines were ranked number two in the nation going into the season, and the Miami Hurricanes were ranked number one. And the very first home game at Michigan Stadium was Miami versus Michigan. So I joined the largest crowd in America watching a football game that Saturday uh, to watch this game. And by the middle of the fourth quarter, Michigan was way up. It was crazy. People were singing, dancing, waving. It was euphoria. Uh, five minutes later, <laughs> this happened. Uh, and you have never seen 106,000 people more depressed and quiet shuffling out of that stadium. I'll never forget it. It was, you've seen them, <laughs> okay. It was pretty bad. Well, spring came and things looked up. Glenn Rice and Ramil Robinson brought home an NCAA championship for Michigan. That was awesome. And more importantly for me, I met John. John actually does look the same as he did 30 years ago. So if someone tells you life is fair, now you know it's not. Um, and John and I began working in the area that I still work in today, which is the intersection of machine learning and natural language understanding. Now a few years later, uh, a friend asked me, hey, what'd they give you that degree for? Uh, and I explained that uh, they gave me that degree for teaching a cartoon robot how to stack up imaginary blocks. To which she said, wow, they'll give you a PhD for that? <laughs> but amazingly, they did. Uh, and off I went to Silicon Valley. Uh, and I arrived at the, the small AI lab that, that uh, John mentioned at Pricewaterhouse. My second day on the job, my new boss walked in and he said, great news. I was just meeting with all the partners of the firm, and we figured out that a lot of our new business comes when there are management changes at our target company. So for example, you know, Sally Smith was named CTO of IBM, something like that. 
Uh, and so I promised the partners that you would write a program that would read all the newspapers in the country every single night, find all those management changes and put them into a database for us so that every morning the partners can come in and find their sales targets. I don't know why he thought I could do that, uh, but, um, but uh, I was pretty quickly thrust out of the world of cartoon robots and imaginary blocks and into the world of building real-world AI systems. Uh, and I'm happy to say that that system that we built actually was uh, one of the main sales lead systems for Pricewaterhouse for many years. All right. So today, uh, I thought I'd talk about this idea of building uh, real-world AI systems uh, and products and I want to talk about three things. First of all, why? I mean, why, why build, uh, why take all this great AI and machine learning and turn it into uh, products that everyday users can use? Second, how? Uh, and I'll give three examples from uh, our work at Google that hopefully you'll find pretty interesting and cool. Uh, and then third, I want to close with some mega trends that I think are going to affect how all of us uh, do AI and build AI products for the next several years. All right, so let's dive in. So why build AI products? There's probably all kinds of reasons, lots of things you could say. Uh, I'm not going to try to list them all, but I'll just say why, what, I, what gets me out of bed, why I like building uh, these products, is AI really has the opportunity to make people more effective. Uh, and let me give a couple examples of what I mean. First example, uh, I'll call it superhuman perception. Uh, the idea that using AI and machine learning, we can give people perceptual abilities that they wouldn't have otherwise. Here's an example that, uh, that some researchers at Google worked on uh, in the idea in the, uh, in the medical area. So uh, diabetic patients uh, are asked to be screened once a year uh, because there, are, there is a risk of blindness that comes. Uh, and so an ophthalmologist will take the photographs like you see here uh, of their retina and then are trained to examine them and look for some key factors. And you can see from this, it's pretty subtle. Uh, it takes a bunch of training to know how to do this. Uh, and then can, can uh, score how much at risk they are and what kind of treatment they need. Now that's great, the problem is that around the world there's a real shortage of specialists who are trained to do this, especially in the developing world. And so what these, these Google researchers did is got a bunch of these labeled images, uh, and you can guess what they did next. They built a deep neural network uh, around these images. One thing that's interesting to me is this, this network, whatever that diagram means up there, uh, is actually the same kind of network, the same topology that's used in Google Photos. Uh, and by the way, if you don't use Google Photos, it's actually pretty awesome. I feel like a commercial, but it, but it is very good and, and can do things like, you know, you type in cats, dogs. My wife and I have this thing where we take pictures of martinis. I don't know why. Uh, and so I can type in martini and I get a picture, all the martini pictures we've taken over the years. That same kind of network was used to classify these images. Uh, and you see the, the results here where this network's doing about as well as these trained specialists. And so what it's enabled is that in those developing world places, doctors who don't have that same degree of training in this specific area can still perform these screenings. Uh, and so really giving them superhuman perception. All right, let's move to something a little more every day. I'll just call it productivity enhancement, uh, where AI can help, get, help you get through your everyday tasks a little more quickly, a little more easily. So one example here uh, is something called Gmail Smart Reply. Uh, this is also, you also have this in, in uh, the text messaging apps on, the, on Android phones. Uh, and you see the little squares at the bottom where, uh, based on what's in the message, we're kind of suggesting some replies. Especially in a text messaging uh, world, this is one of these things that like once you have it on your phone, if it were to disappear, it's like your phone's broken. Like you just get used to like, you know, tapping these things, sure I'll be there, right? Yes, works for me, those kinds of responses. Uh, a little more advanced than the one on the on the the side here uh, is something called Gmail Smart Compose. This is, what this thing is is why when you begin to type your e your email out, uh, little suggestions of how you complete the entire sentence will jump out. Um, and on the phone, it's actually very satisfying. You, you're you're tapping away, and these th this thing appears, and you actually swipe across it in order to like select it and and get that into your email. And again, it's one of these things that just makes doing an email, especially on a phone where it's hard to type way more, fa way faster, way more efficient. So giving people superhuman perception, helping them with their productivity. The last one I'll talk about is the area, of course, I've been working on for uh, the last several years, uh, and I'll call it being an assistive partner. 
you know, if you, you know, we have all this great technology, and it's, it's great, I love it, we all love it. Uh, we have all these apps and websites and all that stuff, but all those things, you know, we have to learn how to interact with them really on their terms, right? Those apps have those buttons and have the functions and the menus. We have to learn how all that stuff works in order to use it. Uh, websites, we have to figure out where to click, all that. Interacting on technology's terms. The idea of a Google Assistant is to say, what if we could use AI to create an, a very human-like conversational interaction that would allow people to tap into all the world's information and services, control their devices in their life and so on, just by saying what they want. Um, and so that's the idea of the Google Assistant is to create that kind of thing using the power of AI uh, to create a super easy interaction. Now, I know in the hallowed halls here of the University of Michigan, it is not a normal thing in a, in a you know, academic setting like this to show a TV commercial in the middle of your talk. Um, so I'm gonna do that now. <laughs> this will just give you a little bit of an idea of what the Google Assistant can do. Let's see if this works. Hey Google, oh, call yeah. Maddie. Okay, dialing now. Hey Google, order my usual from Starbucks. All right, getting Starbucks. Hey Google, call my brother. Hey Google, call my brother. Text Carol. Can you text Carol for me too? Hey Google, who just texted me? Yo Google. Kevin. Kevin, that was great, but we haven't made Yo Google work yet, so you have to say Hey Google. Hey Google. Hi, how can I help? Play some Sia. <laughs> Hey Google, play the next episode. Play The Crown on Netflix. All Channing Tatum movies. Yo, Google. That was great. Um, can we just get one where you say, hey Google? Hey Google, find my phone. Whoa. Hey Google. Hey Google. Hey Google! Yo Google, lock the front door. Okay, let's just go with Yo Google then. I'm sure the engineers would love to update everything. Yo. <laughs> you. <laughs> All right, first time I saw that I thought, oh boy, now we're gonna have to make Yo Google work. Uh, but that, <laughs> that, luckily that hasn't come yet. Um, so that gives you an idea of what the assistant can do. And, and this is an example that I, that I actually like to use just to explain that a little bit more. Because what I love about uh, this kind of approach is that it's taking lots and lots of powerful technology, but packaging it in a way that makes it simple for regular people to use. So the example I like to use is, when I go visit my mom and dad, of course they wanna know what their granddaughter Chloe is up to. Is she still riding horses? Uh, and so I can pull out my phone and just say, hey Google, show me pictures of Chloe on a horse. And instantly, up come these, these kinds of cute pictures of my daughter riding, her ho riding horses. Uh, now, we all understand that under the covers, there's literally hundreds of person years uh, of research and AI that go into making this little thing happen. Everything from speech recognition to take that sound I made, turn it into words, language understanding, something we call a personal versus public model to understand whether I wanted uh, images from the internet versus images from my own photo album image understanding to recognize Chloe and recognize those horses automatically. I didn't tag all that stuff. The computer did that for me. And even text-to-speech output that lets my mom hear, sure, here are your photos after I ask for them. But for my parents, they don't care about any of that. They just ha experience that, well, of course, I just ask the phone or, or the, the uh, computer for what I want, and instantly it comes up on the screen and I can enjoy my photos of Chloe. So that's the kind of experience that I think we can build uh, by combining uh, these kinds of AI technologies. All right, so those are a few reasons why I get excited about building these kinds of products. Let's talk about how. How do you build these AI products? Well, you have super smart science people like you, all of you. Uh, and you guys do things like create algorithms and tune them and analyze data and do software engineering to really make the thing work. Now, I'm blessed at Google, I've got tons of these, maybe not the ones with the beakers and stuff, but tons of, of folks who are fantastic at this. Uh, and so I'm, and all of you, within whatever your sub area is, you're way more of an expert on whatever it is that you do than I'll ever be. So I'm not gonna try to talk to you about algorithms and, and machine learning techniques and all of that. Obviously, that's a key part of building products that work with AI. But when you get into real world products, there's another challenge that I think is equally as big uh, as understanding all those algorithms and learning techniques. 
And, that, and I want to illustrate it with uh, this little cartoon with a fair-haired AI researcher. And she finds herself uh, in a barn full of straw. Now, luckily for her, I guess, Rumpelstiltskin shows up. And he says what he always says, hey, don't worry. I'll turn all this straw for you into gold. But she's smart. She knows what she really needs. She says, gold? <laughs> I don't need gold. <laughs> I need training data. That's the key thing. So really, a, a huge challenge in real-world AI is how do you get the training data that you need any way you can in various creative ways, and I'm going to describe some, in order to train the models that will do those real-world tasks that users, uh, that you can do to help users. Uh, so let me give some examples of, of uh, ways that we've done this in the Google Assistant. And like I said, the reason I thought this is interesting is, as I watch my teams work, this question of how do you get training data uh, and creatively use it is every bit as important as the software engineering, the machine learning techniques, uh, the AI models, and all of that. All right, so the first technique uh, that I'll, 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 I just gave these things little names, I'll call it multiply your data. Take the data you have and multiply it in order to solve the problem you want. Uh, and the problem that we'll, use, that we'll use to illustrate this is something called neural beamforming for far field speech recognition. Now, far field speech recognition really just means that if there's, say, a Google Home speaker over there, uh, I'm over here, but I want to talk to that speaker. Uh, and so that's far field as opposed to near field where I'm holding a microphone right here uh, next to where I'm speaking. And the, the issue with far field speech recognition, and you can kind of hear it even in this room, even in kind of a quiet room, there's all kinds of reflections, reverb, sound coming at that microphone from all sorts of different directions. And you guys are all being, you know, pretty polite and quiet, but, you know, like in a normal house like mine, there's kids yelling at each other in the background, and maybe there's dogs barking and TVs playing, all kinds of other noise as well. And yet I want to speak to Google from across the room and ask it a question and have it hear just me and answer. Now, the traditional way that people solve this is something called beamforming. Uh, all beamforming really means is kind of focusing the processing uh, uh, on a particular direction uh, that, that the sound is coming in and, and basically ignoring the other uh, directionality. And the traditional approach for this is kind of a geometric approach uh, where you have a set of microphones at a known spacing apart from each other, and based on things like the timing of when sound comes in, you then can do kind of a geometric type of calculation to decide which direction uh, to focus uh, your, your ears, kind of, your processing. The problem with that, that traditional approach is that a couple things. One is it's kind of expensive to put all those microphones onto your device. Uh, and you know, if you're trying to build something for the masses, that kind of drives the price up, makes it complicated. Second, it has actually a very bad error condition where uh, if, if that calculation is off and the beamformer points the wrong direction, you literally just don't hear anything of what you're trying to hear. And so it's kind of all or nothing. It's either right or it's completely wrong. So our idea was, we said, instead of this geometric calculation across all these microphones, what if we could build the beamforming into the speech recognition uh, network itself uh, by having a couple microphones sending both signals to speech recognition and allowing the neural network to actually learn the beamforming function along with the speech recognition function. Um, and if we could do that, we could build simpler uh, speakers that are cheaper uh, and have a nicer kind of uh, degradation with theirs. Now, unfortunately, all we had before we launched uh, the, the far field version of the assistant was tons of near field transcribed speech recognition data. And so what the team did is actually built a fairly complex simulator, took that near field data, and then basically placed those speakers into all sorts of different sizes and shapes of rooms, rooms with carpeting, rooms without with hardwood floors, glass walls, walls with tarps on the walls, uh, dogs in the room barking, TVs playing in the background, people talking over, uh, and basically simulated in a fairly uh, complex way all sorts of conditions by adding uh, these kinds of, of effects into the sound, into the audio files that we had. Um, we started with 50,000 hours of, of, uh, of audio data, and the, uh, the team blew it up by 100x. And so we ended up with 5.7 centuries of continuous audio to train the system. Um, it's a pretty clever way to get a lot of data. So this model took a little while to train, uh, even with all the, the big data centers that Google has. But lo and behold, 
the punchline, of course, is this actually works really, really well. Uh, so the blue line here is Google. The black is some other, you know, home, in home <laughs> assistant product. Uh, and this data set, by the way, is, a, is actually a very difficult one. So this is a, a, a test set that is a thousand utterances that actually have pretty extreme far field and various kinds of noise and reverb conditions. Uh, and you can see that even though that competing product has seven microphones built into it, and the Google product only has two microphones, Google actually does uh, pretty dramatically better uh, at this far field recognition task because of this technique of multiplying the data we had and blowing it up into uh, the kind of data that we needed. So multiplying your data, that was one way. Let me give a second example. Uh, I, I call this one good enough to great. Uh, uh, and the example here is neural semantic parsing. So neural semantic parsing, par all I mean by semantic parsing is the process of taking a sequence of words and understanding the semantic intent uh, that a user is trying to accomplish with those words. So maybe the simplest example you can think of that these systems do is setting an alarm, right? So I wanna say, set an alarm for 6 a.m. and the intent is some structured representation of set alarm and the, and the argument, of course, is 6 a.m. Uh, it's pretty simple, right? Simple little task. Well, it turns out that you know, language is hard. Like even in English, in, in the US, people say to Google, uh, this simple thing of setting alarm in over 5,000 syntactic variants uh, that are different from each other. Here's some examples. The one I really like is this flight to catch. Wake me up at six. Like, I don't know why the person felt they need to tell us that there's a flight to catch, but they, their expectation clearly is that we'll understand the flight to catch part is just sort of extra information, but the real thing is, really, please wake me up at six. Uh, and of course, the expectation of our users that, is that across all those language variations that we'll turn this into the right semantic intent uh, in order to do the right thing. Now, of course, we use you know, some fancy neural network thing Bob, to do this. This is you know, some feed forward recurrent network that we use to feed the words through and, and generate these intents. Uh, that's great. The issue is where does this stuff on whatever, this side come from? Where does this training data come from? How do you get it? Now, you might say, if you were you know, a professor at Michigan, you might say, I'll just get all my graduate students, I will lock them in a room, bring them pizza, and I will have them write on the whiteboard every way they can think of, of saying uh, to set an alarm, and then I'll have my training set. Okay, so that's one way. You could do that. The problem is that even the, those, that army of graduate students, or if it was Google, maybe we'd say interns, cannot think up enough ways uh, that represent the real variability that people have with human language. And so you need something more than that. Uh, and so here's an idea. Maybe your users can just help you do this. Uh, so the idea here, you can see the steps. Number one, build a good enough system somehow. Now in this language space, good enough system might be that your graduate students write examples and then you train your first network, or it might be that you write some regular expressions or something, don't tell my bosses that I said that, uh, or, or you know, some other way that you make the system kind of work. Then you put it out there. And you know, these systems tend to have early adopters who will try things, and so you get some usage. And sometimes it works, and people are excited. But a lot of times it doesn't work. And that's great because you can harvest all those cases where it didn't work, uh, and then you can train on those and launch a great system. Now, it's not just a theory. This is, this is uh, kind of the way we built the Google Assistant, uh, or a lot of parts of it, and this really works well. Here the blue bars are uh, kind of our good enough system, and the red bars are more like approaching our great system. And what I want to tell you about this is these blue bars are not just uh, a couple Google interns giving it a shot. These are actually uh, kind of coming from really before we moved to neural techniques, and we really spent a, you know, a bunch of professional linguists, uh, computational linguists and, and computer scientists spent a lot of time on these particular grammars, really trying to tune them uh, and hand create them. Uh, so this is you know, many, many person months of work went into each of these blue bars. And yet you see that once you harvest the data uh, from your users uh, and just train a machine learned system, it blows away those, those uh, those hand-built systems pretty dramatically, actually. We were, we were, I'll be honest, we were kind of surprised by this, by how well this worked, how much difference it made. 
All right, so you can multiply your data that you have to do what you want. You can make a good enough system and get your users to give you the right things you need to build a great system. I'll just give one more example. Uh, I'll call this watching an expert. Uh, and the example here is a system that we uh, have been working on called Google Duplex. Now, let me give you a little bit of background on Duplex. Uh, Duplex is based on the idea that if I want to be an assistant for people, sometimes what an assistant needs to do is pick up the phone and make a call for me. Uh, and so with Duplex, we've created a technology that's able to make certain kinds of phone calls on users' behalf to businesses uh, in order to get things done. And I'm going to show you, not a TV commercial, but it is kind of a marketing little video thing, but just to show you kind of what this looks like uh, in, in usage. Let's see if we can make this one work. Oops. Hey Google, book a table for two at El Cocotero on Tuesday at 7. All right, just in case that's not available, can I try between 7 p.m. and 8 p.m.? Sure. All right, I'll call to book under your name and phone number, and I'll update you in the next 15 minutes. Is that okay? Perfect, thanks. El Cocotero, how may I help you? Hi, I'm the Google Assistant, calling to make a reservation for a client. Um, this automated call will be recorded. Can I book a table for Tuesday the 12th? Okay, cool. And how big is the party? It's for two people. Great. And when did you say they want to come in? Um, Tuesday at 7 p.m. Okay, let me check. Mm-hmm. I don't have 7, but we can do 8. Yeah, 8 p.m. is fine. Perfect. And can I get their name? The uh, first name is Anna. Okay. We'll see you on a Tuesday. Thank you. Okay, awesome. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Anna for two. Right this way. All right, so that gives you a little bit of idea of what we're trying to do with this, uh, where the Google Assistant can make a phone call on a user's behalf to complete uh, a simple task like, like a restaurant reservation. Now, when we first started to build this, uh, the team kind of thought, well, gee, we've got a lot of the pieces. I mean, it's, it's speech recognition, right? It's a little bit of language understanding and dialogue stuff. We got a bunch of that stuff laying around. And then it's kind of text to speech output to create the voice. Uh, and so they loaded all that stuff onto the first version of Duplex was this, this Mac laptop here. Uh, and Mac laptops have this nice, at least this one, has a nice property that the microphone and the speaker are just about the right distance apart that you can put a phone there. Uh, and so this really was the first version of Duplex. Uh, and, but it turned out just wiring those things together didn't quite get it done. Uh, and I want to just play you a recording uh, of an early version of the system just so you can hear what that wiring together was like. I'm calling on behalf of Mr. Leviathan. I'd like to book a table for Thursday, December 4th for 7 p.m. for a party of four. Thursday, December 4th. At uh, what time? Sorry, can you say that again? What time? For 7 p.m., please. Hello. Okay, so 7 p.m. for four people? Yes, we have that available, and what name? The name is Leviathan. L-E-V-I-A-T-H-A-N. And the first name? Can you repeat, please? I didn't get that. <laughs> All right, it's painful. <laughs> it's painful, but that's what it was. It's fun. Um, anyway, so we realized there was some work to do uh, and some data that we were missing uh, in order to really create a great system. And the, the, the key insight of this work is what is listed here, which is, look, if you can define a pretty narrow task, then you can get experts to do that task and, and you can use those observations uh, in order to really see 
approximately all of the different permutations and paths through the task, uh, and then your learning system can capture that uh, and actually be able to deal with those permutations. So in duplex, we defined a set of narrow tasks. Duplex does exactly three things today. One is it can call a restaurant to ask for its hour, opening hours on a holiday. Second, it can make a restaurant reservation like you saw in the video. Third, it can book a hairdresser appointment, a hair salon appointment. Uh, now, when we first talked about duplex, uh, we had a lot of folks in the world and in the press freak out a little bit, and I understand, and kind of say, like, oh my gosh, like, has Google like, somehow solved some AI thing, and now Google's going to be making phone calls all over the place, having conversations with people, uh, and I actually did kind of a press tour to try to explain to folks that like, this just is not the case. What we've, we've made a really cool thing, but this really cool thing literally can have a human-like conversation about these three things and nothing else. Right? So if you are in the middle of the restaurant reservation thing and the, the person at the other end of the phone says, hey, by the way, since you're the Google Assistant, what do you think about Trump? Or what's the weather in Ann Arbor this weekend? Or whatever. What you'll, what you'll hear is that the system will just say again, um, I'm not sure, but do you have a table for three on Thursday? <laughs> uh, and then if it continues, basically we bow out of the conversation. Uh, and just say, sorry, I, I, it sounds like we aren't quite connecting on this, I'll, I'll call you back, and then we have a human call back and, and finish the reservation. So we really, it's really a very narrow task. Uh, and then we hired a set of experts uh, that we could observe. Uh, our first set of experts was a bunch of engineers uh, that we made sit in this room and do this task, but uh, eventually turned into kind of a real call center. Uh, so we have a small call center where folks uh, actually are kind of trained in how to do these three tasks. Uh, so they kind of do it in a consistent way uh, and carry out making real calls for users or, or Googlers to make those reservations. And then we record those, and we have built a tool so that those experts can then, after their call, basically annotate what happened. Now, this is a little bit hard to see, uh, but what's happening here is that for each step of the conversation, uh, say that the person said, uh, the time I want is 11 a.m., the experts go through and in this tool here, using a set of kind of known intents, they label each statement. So for example, if the uh, restaurant person says, okay, that's for three people uh, on Saturday the 19th, what time do you wanna come? They would label it and say, okay, they confirmed the number of people, they confirmed the date, and they're asking for the number of people, and they put that in a structured way. And so what you end up with when you label uh, many, many conversations like this is kind of a structure of all the different ways that that conversation can go. Uh, and it is pretty narrow, but on the other hand, there turns out to be a, a fair number of paths uh, through the conversation, but it's kind of finite so that you can mostly get through it. We then learn a, a, a dialogue system from this data uh, and we're able to, uh, to do this. There's a lot of interesting problems hidden in here, things like how speech recognition works over a phone, uh, that, where you can be strongly biased towards this task and so on, uh, but it all comes together uh, and we end up with a fairly robust system uh, that's able to handle a lot of these calls in a completely autonomous way. And I wanna play one more call for you, just to, again, the, sort of show the variability, some of the things that you might not think about that can actually happen in one of these calls, uh, and then having seen enough examples, the system is able to handle. So let's listen to one more of these calls. And the, the bubbles here are showing some of the things that you'll hear, that you'll hear in this one. Hi, Oren Summers. Can you hold, please? Mm-hmm. Hi, sorry about that. How can I help you? Hi, I'm calling to make a reservation. I'm Google's automated booking service, so I'll record the call. Um, can I book a table for Thursday the 28th? Sure, no problem. What time? At 7 p.m. Okay, for how many people? It's for six people. Oh, unfortunately, we cannot do six people at 7 p.m. Could you do 6.30? Do you have anything between 7 p.m. and uh, 9 p.m.? Um, I could do 7.45 or 8.30. 7.45 p.m. is fine. Okay, great. What's the name? The first name is Stephen. Stephen, and can I have Stephen's email address? I'm afraid I don't have permission to share my client's email. Okay, no problem. Can I have his phone number? The phone number is um, 
two, one, three, two, zero, one, five. Okay, perfect. So to recap, that was a party of five at 7.45 p.m. on the 28th. Um, I need a table for a party of six. Ah, right. My mistake. Party of six. Okay, you're all set. We'll see you then. Okay, awesome. Thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. Bye-bye. All right, so uh, I know you probably didn't expect to listen to telephone calls today about, uh, about restaurant reservations, but there's actually a lot of interesting effects that you heard there, things like being put on hold at the beginning, the negotiation they had over the time, uh, the correction where the system had to uh, say, no, actually, I, I needed a party of six, uh, where, where the, the person taking the reservation made a mistake. So a lot of interesting things that we can learn by picking a narrow domain and then watching experts carry out the task. Okay, so, uh, so I want to, again, claim this, this thing of, of getting the training data you need is a key element. We've talked about a few different ways here, multiplying your data, uh, building something good enough, narrowing a task so you could watch experts do it and learn from observations. There's obviously tons of other ways, and I, honestly, I had to pick these three out of you know, 10 or 15 different examples I could have chosen from, um, but this is really a key, a key problem. Okay, so we've talked about why build AI products, a little bit about how, at least how to, how to uh, deal with data. Yes, so our, our heroine can get her training data that she wants. Uh, let me finish, let me close up by talking about a few, uh, I'll just call it mega trends, things I think are, are happening that are gonna affect the way that all of us do AI and build AI products over the next few years. And you know, some of these are, are kind of obvious, I always tell my team, they actually pay me to say obvious stuff. Um, but, uh, but I think taken together, it's kind of an interesting, an interesting picture. Okay, so the first one uh, I wanna mention is this proliferation of ubiquitous connected devices. Now we all know this, uh, but you know, it, it may, it, you may not realize the degree to which and the speed to which this is happening, where many, many devices uh, are getting very in inexpensive connectivity built into them. Um, you know, you may have seen Amazon's recent set of announcements where, you know, they have an Amazon Basics microwave uh, that actually has kind of a chip inside it that lets it be automated by Alexa. And you're going to see more and more of this, uh, where everything from your light bulbs, your camera, your car, your hair dryer uh, are going to be uh, connected in some way. And I think this is a pretty interesting thing as we think about AI devices in terms of that ability to... A, maybe control and coordinate those devices for people, but also the massive amount of data about, uh, from the sensors about what I'm doing, my context, and so on, that could potentially be useful to help, uh, to help, me, uh, to help our AI systems uh, help people be more productive. A second uh, mega trend I'll mention is, let's call it on-device AI or edge computing. You know, when I, when I got here to the AI lab in 1988, we had, it didn't quite look like that, but we had uh, these, uh, I think it was DEC Alpha machines, uh, and somebody, I don't know, one of these guys, someone got a grant, I think, and bought us a bunch of SGI machines. And it was like, oh my gosh, it changed the world, right? Suddenly everything went like three times faster, uh, and then someone rewrote SOAR from Lisp to C++. And then it was like 30 times faster. It was unbelievable. <laughs> like all of a sudden you could actually do your research. It was amazing. Um, fast forward to today, and part of the reason that those techniques that Rada mentioned that were started developing in the 70s actually work now is because Google and others have giant you know, buildings full of connected, interconnected computers that create a huge amount of compute power. And we figured out you know, how to interconnect those computers to form one giant uh, compute infrastructure that lets us do things like uh, process 5.7 centuries of audio in order to build a model, right? And so this is a large part of why these things begin to work today. Fast forward to tomorrow, and what's happening is that the compute uh, structure that's needed for these kinds of neural models is being shrunken down and put into devices. Uh, and this will become more and more uh, common uh, and more and more inexpensive, where phones will have neural processing units built into them uh, that maybe can't build that model of the 5.7 centuries of audio, but it can run that model. Right? And this is starting with things like computational photography on phones, but you'll see pretty quickly that speech, uh, more advanced vision, other kinds of, of AI sensing uh, and AI capabilities will start to be built right into the phone and other kinds of devices. 
And I think it introduces a lot of interesting things as we think about how AI systems will work, what can happen right in the device that I have in my hand or in my home, what needs to happen in the cloud, how do those things interrelate, how do we explain to users what in the world's going on when that happens, uh, but it introduces a whole new set of possibilities of the kinds of capabilities we can create. All right, third one here uh, is personalization. Now, I mentioned uh, that set of uh, ubiquitous sensors, tons of data coming from all that stuff, potentially. As I use my phone, I'm generating tons of data. As I use other products. Uh, and so AI systems, of course, potentially, can use a lot of that data about me, my context, my preferences, what I'm doing, uh, what I've been doing in the past, what other people did last time, what I should do maybe this time, in order to create highly contextual, highly personalized experiences. Now, this, of course, is fraught with all sorts of questions. Uh, and they're questions that I don't think, certainly it's not questions that Google has answered completely, it's not questions that society has answered yet. I think there's a whole set of questions that uh, we as a community and that, uh, that society needs to look at and, and, we'll, and we'll look at over the next several years, uh, I think, around how does that data flow? How, do pri how does privacy work in this environment? What are systems allowed to see? Uh, what can you do with those things that you see? How do we uh, really respect users' privacy, their ability to control what's happening, uh, and add the value for them uh, that, that can potentially be added here? So I think there's a lot of complicated questions here, and the way that that plays out over the next few years is gonna have a huge impact on the AI products that all of us build over the next several years. All right, a fourth one that I'll claim is, I don't know, going to be a trend, uh, is personification. Uh, so, you know, as we build systems where the interaction is more human, right away what you find is that people ascribe personality uh, and expect personality in those interactions. Uh, and so, uh, you know, there's work by Clifford Nass and others that shows that, you know, even it's sort of inanimate objects, uh, people will ascribe personality. And my personality lead always, uh, Google always gives the example that if you take a rock and you stick a couple of those little plastic, you know, eyes on there, suddenly it has a personality. And people actually start to interact with the rock in a different way. Uh, so much more so when you think about things like voice and vision and natural conversation that people ascribe personality. Uh, now today, Google and, and the other players in the space, uh, Alexa, Siri, and Cortana, and so on, basically have a scripted personality. So at Google, we went out and hired folks from Disney and Pixar and The Onion and places like that, that like literally kind of scripted, wrote our Google's, Google Assistant's personality. The other competitors have done the same kind of thing. Uh, I think there's a rich research area here, by the way, uh, in the future. We've just scratched the surface. There's all kinds of work to make that personality richer, make it more interesting, maybe make it more contextual, make it respond more to me, uh, more in the way that, uh, that a human uh, interaction partner would. Lots of work to be done here. But this idea of personification that today we've kind of hacked by, uh, by scripting it is not going to go away. Uh, and so there's an opportunity there. And then the last one uh, that I'll mention uh, is about knowledge. And I want to claim that even in this world of uh, raw sensor data and raw sound waves and pictures and vision and stuff and neural networks, that in fact knowledge still plays a really important role. Uh, and that at least for the foreseeable future, while machine learning and neural systems will do an amazing job of taking inputs and mapping uh, them to, uh, to uh, outcomes, Something about those outcomes needs to be known by systems uh, in order for them to help and to be a truly an assistant. The reason I put a picture here of some folks going to the movies uh, is if you think about movies as just a simple everyday experience that we've all had in our human experience, sure, today Google and the other assistants in the world, you can say what's playing at the theater and it'll list off some movies and you can, with Google's assistant, you can even buy a ticket, that's great. But you know, Google actually, uh, Google Assistant and I think the other players in the space actually know almost nothing about the experience of going to the movies. But as soon as I talk to the movies about you, think of all the things that you know. You know right away that movies last about an hour and a half, maybe two hours if it's kind of a long one. You know that you usually go with other people, but you could go by yourself. You know that you're gonna go to the movies locally. You're not gonna fly to New York to go see a movie probably. You're gonna go here in Ann Arbor. You know that the ticket price is not actually very important. 
that the tickets, it's kind of a commodity. They all cost about the same. You're probably gonna go buy more by location or something else that you like the seats or the screen or something like that. You even know things like that for a restaurant reservation, if you have a reservation at 7 p.m., you should show up at 7 p.m., but for a movie, if it starts at 7 p.m., you should probably show up at quarter to seven, right? All those things are things that you immediately know because you've had that human experience of going to the movie. Today, our AI systems know zero of those things, I would claim, at least I'll tell you that Google doesn't know any of those things, but imagine if we did have that kind of knowledge. And I don't know that we're gonna learn that knowledge per se, maybe you could learn some of it, uh, but by knowing more of those things, uh, potentially about human experience, potentially these assistants can be way more powerful. All right, so we talked about why to build AI products. I've talked a little bit, hopefully, with some examples that you found interesting about how, and in particular, how to find, make, get the training data that you need in order to build these systems. And we've talked about a few mega trends. You know, it's a, an amazingly exciting time to be working in AI. The, the winter is over, uh, obviously, and uh, you know we're really on the cusp on just getting started of building some pretty amazing experiences for users that will help people become more productive. And so I'll just leave you with the question of, given this amazing time that we're in, what will all of you build? Thanks very much.